We will welcome everybody. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. Right. Everybody. Yes, Although a ready morning, but as we can see that uh, the rain couldn't dampen the spirit of this uh, students who have come here in large numbers. And believe me, uh, a double number of students were retained. So thank you, Calcutta, for responding to us, the schools of Calcutta especially. Uh, good morning, Professor Shen. Good morning, Jay. Good morning, my colleagues. And the teachers, uh, as you know, this program is jointly organized by American Center and BITM. And now I request Jay to please come on the dais and uh, give a warm welcome to all the audience here. Okay, okay. Namaskar. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. How is everybody? I used to be a teacher, so I like I like this position. But I will call on you if I have a question. I'm, I'm not shy about that. Okay, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I want to thank Dr. Islam, uh, Gautam Shield. Thank you so much for the warm uh, introduction and for partnering with us today. We have a really exciting talk, a really useful talk from a, a physicist all the way from Buffalo, New York. Um, Dr. Dr. Sen. Um, I am the Deputy Director of the American Center. My name is Jay Trudor. The American Center, if you don't know, is in between Park Street and the Maidan Metro. And we would love to see you there. Um, we do a lot of events there, like, like this, lectures, sometimes concerts, sometimes musicals, all sorts of things. So if you haven't been, consider coming. Um, one reason you should consider coming is for education. Now, you're in school, um, but if you're curious about studying in the United States, maybe when you get older, we have a whole office there that can help you. Um, that's what Dr. Sen did. He started his education here. He moved to the United States. And if you're interested in studying, um, we would love to see you. Okay. Um, it's to me. It's uh, really exciting that you're here. Um, this is for you. Uh, both the Indian government and the United States government really cares about your education. Um, we hope that maybe even the resources we have and the lectures we provide can inspire you. Um, so I'm I'm going to end here. Um, let, let's get on with the show. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Islam are you, uh, to, to the stage, and he's going to welcome our eminent speaker. Have a great time and ask questions. Uh, even if your teachers are here, it's okay, you can still ask questions. Thank you. Thank you good morning, a very warm welcome to the IGN and to this morning's lecture session. I have the privilege and honor to introduce before you to the speaker. Dr. Shodhit Singh. A son of the soil, Dr. Singh studied at South Point High School in Calcutta and entered the Presidency College in 1979 to study physics. Got lost in his way a few times and eventually did a PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Georgia in 1989. For the first 25 years, he has been a professor of physics at the State University of New York at Marshall Road, where his job is to ask questions and seek answers to a variety of vexing problems in physics and beyond. Seriously, this is what he gets paid for. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. This summer, he is happy to be a Fulbright Nehru Academic and Professional Excellence Fellow at the Indian Institute of Engineering, Science and Technology, Singapore, and 
and that is how he is in town, and that is how we got him here with us till this morning. Can you all join me in giving Dr. Shane a lousy welcome? The house is yours. Thank you. This has been a quite incredible uh, welcome for me. Very overwhelming. Uh, I usually uh, like to All right. So, as I said, it's it's really overwhelming. I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. I'm a, I'm a Calcutan by birth. I, I remain a Calcutan as a result. My uh, although I'm a physicist, what I learned along the way is it is it is increasingly difficult to separate between physics, chemistry, engineering, technology development, and so on and so forth. The world changed between the time when I was an undergraduate student in physics at Westminster College. Um, and the time I became a professor in the early 2000s. How did the world change? Well, physics was the usual stuff that you see in the syllabi, no matter where you go. And then physics became everything. So that was a very exciting journey because I suddenly realized that I could be a physicist and I could really do anything I want. Which brings me to the talk today because one of the things I want to tell you is that you don't have to go very far or look very deep to run into frontiers of this subject. And I hope that no matter what your interests, you will be you will be interested by and large in exploring stuff around you, which is what I want to talk about today. So uh, from sand, dust, and sticky stuff. I'll tell you what sticky stuff I have in mind. Uh, the front here is the physics, which is which is what this topic is. Um, this is my email, so I sincerely put this out because if any of you have any question at any time about something that you feel I may know or may not know but have some idea about, you're more than welcome to drop me an email. I try and respond to every email. I don't know too many things. What I know, I tell you. What I don't know, I try and steer you in the right direction. Okay, so, so this is my email, and you're always welcome to email me. There is no question that is uh, sufficiently uh, boring or uninteresting or silly. So, so you should ask whatever question you have in your mind. Chances are you're asking a very good question. Okay? So just know that. So I talk about sand grains, you know, we all know what sand grains are, you just have to go to a construction site in the city and you can run into more than one sand grain, I'm sure. Uh, and the lessons learned, and the lessons learned is quite, quite serious and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. And then rather briefly, I'll go to stuff that's smaller and smaller. Uh, I'll talk about dust, and when I say dust, I mean all kinds of dust, including dust that's possibly here. Uh, Dust in interstellar space. So dust is a huge subject, and we know very little about dust. So there you go. So so you can just uh, you know take the broom and get to work. Um, all of you have surely spilled some liquid along the way. Uh, you probably had some milk or tea in the morning, and you'll be surprised when you have spilled some. And so tea stains and coffee stains turn out to be a fascinating an area to explore. This is not my area. I learned about this particular area from a friend of mine, and I'll tell you a little bit about him as I go along, because this is a subject which I learned from him. And you can look at his lectures, which are online. You learn about why this stuff is our teacher as well. 
and then then I'll, I'll venture out to an area where they shouldn't go into the building. But I always like to stick my neck out and, and pose questions, which hopefully uh, will generate answers eventually. The answers don't have to come from me, but some of you may be able to explore these. Now, I talk about discoveries to be made, and in particular, I talk about discoveries uh, that you can perhaps easily relate to uh, in, in most of India, and in particular in Calcutta, and most of the world. So, that said, if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll try to make it as informal as and as participatory as possible. So, before I start, I want to say a few words because to me, physics has like I said, has been, has been an important journey. Uh, so why do we study science or engineering or math? Well, that's, that's a really serious issue because we all study something because we, we like it somehow, right? So, uh, or maybe, you know, we are, we are supposed to study it because we want to make a living. Either way, there is, there is some kind of compulsion to study something. So curiosity, challenge, or a desire for living, that's typically the reason why we get into something. And uh, you know, nothing is pretty much free, also the world is changing in that regard. Things are becoming more and more free. But eventually somebody has to pay for it. Uh, we pay for it, our family pays for it. Eventually the government, the society pays for it. Right? So it's, it's, it's something that we can, we can do advanced study in the field because somebody is paying for it. It's, it's not free. It, it is, it's, it's, a, it's an edifice that's been building up for a while. Uh, so the scientists, engineers, etc. What does one do? Well, that's up to you. But hopefully, try and solve important problems that somehow benefit humankind. Yeah? Because that's, after all, the purpose of this endeavor, of this journey. And one important thing is that science and technology are largely among the few completely borderless enterprises. And I have friends. Who I work with all over the world, and the email or Skype or something connects, connects us. I have, I have a former student I work with almost every week who is in Japan, who is all over Japan lately. I have another former postdoc I work with all the time, sometimes in Thailand, sometimes in Japan, sometimes in Taiwan. I have, I have another kid in Brazil. So, you know, it's like that. The world has changed, and, and science and technology are truly borderless enterprises. There is no such thing as Indian science or American science. Science is for everyone. And it's entirely and heavily collaborative, no matter which discipline of, of science you're in. And engineering and tech development as well. So ultimately, human society uh, is, the, is the beneficiary of this enterprise. So I, I, I want us all to be, I don't want to lecture anyone really, but I am lecturing anyway. Because this, I believe, is important that we should be doing science because we need to make sure that people benefit from this enormous edifice that we pay for. And that doesn't mean you can't ask fundamental questions, but that does mean that we shouldn't get lost asking fundamental questions to which the answers may not be very useful, uh, even in the long run. Okay, so there's a lot of latitude, but there's not infinite latitude in there. It's a matter of taste. So anyway, let's look at sand. So sand grains, uh, sand grains can, can be quite varied. So here I, I try to uh, hunt out some sand grains. Uh, this is sand from Okinawa. Okinawa uh, is by the uh, by the sea, by the ocean there. Uh, sea of Japan, I think I don't know where that is. It's in the southern part of Japan. Uh, so this is sand from Okinawa. You can see that this stuff is an old uh, shell of some Sea, uh, you know, sea life. Uh, here, for example, you have more volcanic uh, origin sand from Costa Rica. Uh, this particular one, I think, is from Hawaii. It's a little quartz crystals, and they're about 100 million years old. So that's very old sand. Uh, this is microscopic shells magnified 300 times. That's also something that we run into as sand, actually. Uh, these two are not from not from our planet, they are from the moon. Here you can see uh, glassy orange spherules from a volcanic eruption about 3.8 billion uh, years ago at the shortly crater of the moon. 
So this one was was collected in the Apollo 17 mission. That was the very last manned mission that we had. Um, and there was one very good geophysicist uh, in the in that mission. Uh, and so this was a very, very important mission that uh, um, that happened. So you can see that these are very specific kinds of sand grains. And this is lunar dust also, uh, but this is from Apollo 11, which is from earlier. Uh, and you can see that the two kinds of sand are The lunar sand is very fine. It's, it's typically it's very, very fine. It's of the order of the animal. It's that fine. And one thing that happens with lunar sand is it, it gets into your skin uh, very easily, and it can it can cause damage to your lungs. So that's one reason why we can't stay on the moon for long, because we don't have the technology that protects us for anything longer than 72 hours on, on the lunar surface. I actually have some fake lunar sand. I didn't bring it because I thought that I would get in trouble. But uh, it, it's mostly volcanic in origin. So this is this is another kind of sand. This is sand which is mostly magnetic particles. This is uh, magnetite grains. And this particular area I've been to, it's, it's a favorite area of mine. It's this great sand dunes national park, which is in south central Colorado, a very remote area, very beautiful area. And it's a very cold uh, desert. And this is not that old. I think it's about uh, somewhere in the world of half a million year old sand. So this is different kind of sand. So I want to tell you a little bit about different kind of sand. Uh, then, I, then I can get into how we simplify it to something which is physically more manageable. But you can see some of the crazy things that sand does. Right? This, for instance, is a dust storm. Just see how how high this is reaching. Okay, so this is some uh, obviously some military kind of thing, and uh, you can see the buildings here. They must be about 25, 30 feet, uh, and you can see how high that is. So we're easily talking uh, many hundreds of feet, probably a order of thousands of feet, uh, and this whole thing is coming uh, at you. It's pretty scary, actually. Just this March, I was driving to New Mexico, to New Mexico desert, and I saw something like this coming at me. And uh, I was on the highway, and my initial impulse was, wait a minute, what am I going to do? And that was a very good question I asked myself. Within seconds, there was absolutely nothing I could see. So, not even like 10 feet ahead. So that's what happens to you. It's, you're, you totally get blown by it and then you can't Because that people dust storm, nothing that bad, but it was, it was quite bad. Why am I telling you about dust storm? But I will say, I will say something which is very interesting, which is that sand can be easily blown up. So this is a bigger scale issue. This, by the way, is, is sand from the Sahara, Sahara Desert. And you can see that this is very pristine sand, uh, pure quartz crystals. Uh, and, and this reddish color comes from iron, fine hematite powder. And there's there's almost nothing else in there. There are no marine shells, uh, no very fine particles, which is what makes the muddy clay soil that we have in many areas of the world, including here. Uh, we don't have that kind of stuff. By the way, clay is also sand. It's very very tiny particles, and you can you can try and look at them. They're so tiny you need a microscope. That, that's how tiny it gets. So Sahara dust. Uh, it, it, it's Sahara sand is it, quite fine, and you can see how large this area is. And there are very interesting things that you can learn from looking at this. Kenya, there is an enormous crater that is seen here from space, and we have done a great deal of studies on, on the properties of craters, and from that we have come to understand a great deal about the evolution of the solar system, what kind of history it had. What kind of collisions it suffered, and that's how we know a great deal, for example, now about the risk of asteroid collisions. Because chances are that within the next, you know, a million years, we'll take quite a few hits. In fact, there is a hit coming up, a hit possibility coming up uh, in my lifetime. Hopefully, uh, it's going to be fun, but, but it's coming up. So, uh, and hopefully, we can stop it. So, we think this is real stuff. We won't be alive if something like this takes place. So the fact is that you know there's a great deal to be done. So you see, we started playing with sand, and so you find here that you're talking about asteroid collisions, you're talking about the nature of sand grains, you're talking about sea life, you're talking about so many different things that are all connected to simple grain of sand that we And this is how 
uh, the sand dunes particularly look like in the Sahara, depending on where the Sahara you are. This particular picture is taken near Morocco. Uh, so, any questions so far? Are you sure you have no questions? Right. So, if you look at this picture, what do you think this is? Which part of the world is this? Let me ask you a question. This is the western part of Africa. Where you go? This is the western part of Africa. This is the Atlantic Ocean here, right? What do you see? So this stuff is flowing from the Sahara all the way to the Americas. We don't know how this happens. We don't understand it. This is called saltation. But how does these sand grains get up that high in the atmosphere? that they get propelled all the way from one continent to another is something that we don't know. There you go, that's a research problem for you. Now you might you might now wonder, okay fine, the sand blowing from the Sahara to the Americas, who cares? That's a legitimate question, right? You know what happens? What happens is that this area of the Atlantic Ocean is the area where all the hurricanes form. And these hurricanes cause billions of dollars worth of damage to properties, to life, and to land. It has a very strong effect on our agriculture in the US. And it hence has a very strong effect on the food production in the world as well, as well as many other things. So how connected these things get? So this is 770 million tons of sand, apparently, that's what I was looking at. That gets transported on a regular basis from one continent to another. And how small are they? 2.5 micron. So one micron is one thousandth of a millimeter. A millimeter is very small. So one thousandth of a millimeter is super tiny. And this is 2.5 micron. What happens from, from what I understand is that uh, these sand grains get kicked up by the air. And the higher they go, the faster they can move because in the upper levels of the atmosphere, the wind velocity is larger, and eventually it has it has to get sufficiently high up that it can essentially get propelled in the direction in which the wind blows, and that's really what you get. So this is not a this is not a fully uh, solved, controlled problem. Just so that you know. and this is a map of what happens in the summertime. The Sahara dust transport goes this way more more into North, North America. Uh, and, and Canada, because Canada starts right around here. And you can see that the wind of transport uh, ends up more uh, in, in, in Latin America. Uh, this area would be mostly Brazil. So, as well as other countries, if not. So, so, this is a big deal, right? So, we don't understand much about sand. So, let me now tell you what we do understand. So, and, and you know, physicists like to simplify things. You know, you know, we can't deal with. Hard stuff. So, uh, this particular toy, which I also have, but I didn't bring, uh, it's sitting in my office back in Buffalo, uh, is a Newton's cradle. Have you ever seen something like this? Yeah? So, the fun thing about this toy is that you can take, you can take one of these balls and, and pull it to the left, let's say, and release it. And what happens is that immediately after that, the one at the other end cleanly swings up. So it tells you a story. Actually, it tells you a story that is very complicated, so complicated that we really don't know how to solve this problem. That's how complicated it is. But we try and kind of pretend we solve it anyway. But basically, what it is is that if you look at it, you see that. The energy moves from this side to that side as if it is a tight bundle. The energy kind of comes, it zooms to the brains and goes to the other one, and that swings out, comes back out, zooms back. So the energy doesn't spread out. And that's very, very strange because we are very used to seeing energy spread out. Right? I, energy spread out. I, I, whatever I do, energy would spread out very easily, but here it doesn't. It turns out that these particles have very special properties. 
By the way, the sand grain is not very different than these particles. So these are simplified spherical sand grains. And many sand grains are spherical. It's not that all sand grains are pointy. It's not that. So, and I'll tell you about the complicated stuff that they go along, hopefully. But this particular experiment, it's something that anybody can do. But this was carried out by a friend of mine uh, in Novosibirsk in Siberia back in 1983-84 period. Vitaly Nesterenko is a professor now at the University of California at San Diego. So what Vitaly Nesterenko did, and, and this project was born out of a very specific question that, um, that the Russian government had him investigate. I will not get into that, but it's something to do with nuclear reactors and so on. So basically what happens is that they took a bunch of, a bunch of uh, uh, stainless steel balls, which are technically you can call them uh, elastic spheres. They're not elastic like in like a rubber band, but they're elastic material, um, as opposed to deformable clay plastic materials. That's what plastic means. So these are elastic spheres, these are stainless steel, stainless steel balls. And what you have here, if you have a striker, so something comes and hits uh, this other end of the board. And here you have a pressure gauge, uh, some kind of a gauge that can measure uh, any force that comes uh, comes at this end because this ball will come and hit this back wall. So what we finally found is very interesting. Found that if he if he has a striker come and hit uh, on, on the right side over here, then the very clean pulse that you record. At the other end, very much like what you see here. So, so in other words, he established that energy must be traveling through this through this alignment of spheres as if it's a tight bundle, which is which is not something that we expect. So let me now go down just two grains, okay? Just two grains and see what happens. So here you have two spheres. You can do this very yourself. Um, they come together. And as they touch each other, a circular area forms at the interface between the two. So it is in the circular area that the two balls have gotten flat. So they squeeze one against the other. And now what happens is that when you squeeze these two spheres, they, they don't like to be squeezed. So they repel. repel. So as they repel, uh, there is a strong repulsive force that suddenly develops. Mark the word suddenly. So it turns out that this quantity, so I just introduced this quantity. Do you know what it's called? Yeah. Uh, you guys are so, so you have a delta there. It has a technical name. It's called overlap. So this overlap parameter measures is by exactly how much these two spheres have come closer to each other. That's what they measure. So it turns out that the repulsive force that these guys feel actually depends upon this overlap. So the reason why I'm telling you this is because a young guy back in 1881 figured it out. And his name was some, some, someone you may have heard of, Heinrich Hertz. So Heinrich Hertz was 21 years old when he figured this out. The paper in German, you can find him. Just Google it, you'll find it. Don't, don't worry about the German, just look at the equations. If you know integration, we will figure it out. So basically what it is that he has these two spheres, then he squeezes them, and then he shows that these spheres repel according to a strange nonlinear law. Mark this power here, pi over two. This, by the way, is a potential energy, but I won't get into potential energy. I have another way of telling you the story. I just talked about forces. So this, I apologize that I couldn't find a more more precise figure of this, but uh, that's my fault because this is one of our papers that just came out in December of last year. So it turns out that there are linear forces and non-linear forces. So what's a linear force? Very simple. Linear forces, you, you push something and the system responds in a way that is proportional to the push. You push it a little, a little bit of change. A little bit of force. If you push it harder, uh, stronger force. That's linear. But non-linear basically means that if I push it a little, then the force may suddenly grow very strong. So, so this kind of stuff is non-linear. So here, that's what happens. It turns out that in the lower case, as these two spheres 
actually these scales are made out of individual atoms. We put them on a computer, we model it in the computer. So these two spheres, they are being squeezed against each other, just like Hertz's problem was. And you see that if you measure the force, this is the force, and this is the overlap. Don't worry about this little filter here. You see that it grows in a nonlinear way in this case. Whereas in this case, it actually grows in a linear way. The difference is very simple. The difference is that these are actually spheres, but these actually are not spheres. They look like spheres. They have flat edges. And when you have flat edges that behave somewhat linearly, when you have these kind of round edges, then they behave nonlinearly. And this nonlinearity makes a huge difference. That's why I'm telling you the story. What does nonlinearity do? Well, it does something that is intuitively pretty obvious. If you press these grains, they paint it. So they simply want to get away from each other. So any kind of any kind of contact lasts for a small amount of time. But in that small amount of time, the system tries to transport as much energy as it can. And this is at the heart of bundling the energy, is what I told you before. So it turns out that if you if you if you do what Nesrenko did, so if you actually put these put these particles, put these strains, put the spheres uh, along the line, uh, and if you hit it at this end, what you find is that you have this tight bundle of energy that goes to the left to right, and it's called a solitary wave. Solitary waves are stuff that mathematicians and physicists make a lot of big deal about, but for me, they're operationally just energy bundle. And that's exactly what you get. While this is a picture that we generate in the computer, there are fantastic experiments that have been done which actually show this in action. Okay. And how do they measure it? The measurement is actually more difficult than you would imagine. What one does is one is one cuts open surgically one of the strains, or more than one of the strains, and inserts a sensor and then closes it back up and makes sure that enough material is dull out of it such that the insertion of the sensor doesn't change its mass. Its mass remains the same. The system is as if nothing has changed. However, one can measure what's going on as the energy propagates through. So that's actually how it's measured. These measurements are very difficult. So you can see that something as simple as a toy, when you're trying to make measurements of that, they can be very, very difficult to see. This stuff is around you, but it's cutting edge frontier science. You would think that from 1881, people would have measured this. Well, guess when it was first done? 1983. And when it was next done? By us in 1995. And when it was next seen experiment? 1997. And then really precise experiments in 1985. This is 2018. It was a short time ago. Now, I showed you all kinds of nasty grains, right? You remember these guys. Hopefully you remember these guys. How do you measure the forces between them? Is that too difficult to do? May not be. Why not? Because, see, um, I showed you that when these two guys come close to each other, they get this circular area where they touch each other. But if the shape of the grains are altered, the circular area is also described like here. We have different kinds of grains. Here, when this grain touches this surface, the area of overlap is different. And because the area of overlap is different, it turns out that the force itself is different. So in other words, you can now treat the force that's involved between grains by simply understanding and knowing what kind of grain shapes are involved. So yes, we can quite precisely model you know, the grains from various places and so on and so forth, which is, which is quite interesting because the fact that we can model them gives us the capability to ask some questions and design some experiments that would otherwise be difficult to do. So now I want to get into using this stuff. So okay, fine, we learned all these things. What good is it if it can't be used? So one question I asked is whether I can whether I can take a granular alignment which could which could basically set a pulse from one end to the other unchanged, which is what Nestor Info showed, to see if you can actually kill much of that pulse. In other words, if you can design something that absorbs an impact. And that can be very useful just for car bumpers.
that can be very useful for you know all kinds of stuff, protecting roads, protecting um, you know runways, protecting buildings from from various damages, protecting structures against earthquakes and what what have you. So you can start asking all these questions, and all these questions can indeed be addressed, right? If you can actually take out these shock waves. Question is how much of a shock wave can you take out? The answer is quite a bit. But that also is cutting edge because you not only want to structure the materials so that, that, for example, I'm trying to show you, but you also want the right materials. You don't want something melt, right? So you want materials which which would melt at high temperatures. You want materials that won't crack out because a lot of the strong materials are ceramics, and ceramics can become very brittle. Also, so there are all these problems that one is really even going to realize. But still, regardless. Can actually use the system to make impact absorption uh, system. So here you can't really tell, but it's a table chain. What is a table chain? I'll show you in a minute. And here is what we call a decorated table. It's the same as this, except now we have larger little particles between the rings. Why am I showing you this? But I'm showing you this because this thing is a very simple impact absorber. We have much more fancy designs now. This work was done some years ago. So this is a table chain, and you can see the grains are shrinking in size as you go along. So it turns out that if you make a large hit here, this line is, is lighter and smaller, right? Because it's smaller, so if it's made of the same material, it's, it's going to be lighter. If something is if, if, if a heavy object, it's a light object, the light object would, would move faster or slower than the heavy object? Faster. So as you progressively shrink it, the grains would try to move faster and faster. So in other words, you're taking one impact and converting it to umpteen collisions, right? Zillions of collisions. So in other words, you're, you're basically dispersing this energy extremely efficiently. How efficient? Well, you can make the systems down to micron scale, even nano scale. That's how efficient you can make it. So you see that if the input force at this end is 200 newtons, which is a unit of force, at the other end, uh, in this case, in this case, uh, you can get at least only five percent tapering, which is very, very modest. Uh, you can get it down by a factor of two, which is actually half it. And in this case, you can get it down to a factor of close to four. And these are very tiny systems, very easy to make. And uh, this particular experiment was done uh, by my uh, friend and collaborator, Juan at one of the NASA uh, bases, the one in Cleveland, NASA. Um, this, is, uh, what is called? this is the NASA Glenn uh, Research Center of the Astronaut John Glenn. So, uh, this, this actually was done in uh, NASA Glenn. So, Bob Donnie was my former student at one time. So, anyway, so you can do this in 2D, you can do this for a sheet as well. Here you can see, if you observe carefully, this is nothing but a table chain. So, these are all table chains. It's a design system, we haven't made it yet, but it turns out that you have an inverted paper chain with the black particles, and you can make it such that it can not only kill the kill the impulse in this direction, but you can also spread it around. So, in other words, you can we can basically play games with shock pulses and, and, and develop structures that are extremely robust against vibration. I, I will now momentarily turn to a serious topic. Years ago, back when I uh, when I first started playing, playing with this problem, I got into this problem not because sand grains uh, seemed particularly exciting, but I got into this problem because uh, I was listening to TV one day, and uh, a lot of the senators that I have a great deal of respect for, Senator Patrick Leahy from Vermont, um, he was talking about landmines. And I had heard about landmines, but I, I really hadn't paid much attention to landmines. And it turns out that landmines are there in 170 countries in the world. There are about 110 million landmines. Landmines are typically small plastic containers, and they contain enough explosives to cause damage to your legs and arms. They are not designed to kill. So they are they are nasty weapons of war. That have always been used uh, dating back to World War One, and uh, these landmines are notoriously difficult to find. 
because landmines are typically buried right around the surface of the ground. So you're talking an inch, maybe less, maybe two. Now you would say that if something is two inches below my feet, I should be able to find it. That's what I thought. The answer is no. I didn't know that. The answer is, I can find oil five miles below my feet because sound propagation over large distances in soil is relatively simple. It's like a wave. But I cannot find stuff which is five inches, four inches, six inches, a foot, two feet below my feet easily because sound propagation is very different in the shallowest depths of soil. And I didn't know that. So Patrick Leahy's uh, story about what landmines were doing around the world, this was 1994, got me involved in this problem. And I said, wait a minute, I'm a physicist. I like playing with sand. I should be able to figure out something. And the first thing we learned is that there is indeed a very nice way to actually see something which is below our feet, a few inches, a few feet below our feet. Uh, and, and this is where that, this world comes from. So this is very old work. These are some landmines. This particular one is a PNN2 Russian mine. It's a very common mine. You'll find this one is a Russian mine, but you know, everybody makes it. Uh, filled with explosives, usually. I have one in my office, it doesn't have explosives. Uh, and back in 1996, when I was doing this work, the one in my office, guess where it came from? It came from the labs of the US Army because I told them I was interested in this. And said, oh, I haven't sent you all the landmines I have. You know, because you can study it, and it's wonderful. So in those days, the world was so different. Of course, they didn't come with explosives, they came with sand and stuff. But I got them in US mail, they arrived in my office, and I was so excited. This would be unthinkable today because we are so much more scary on it. So I have exactly this mine, which is an anti-personnel mine. I also have a larger mine, which is an anti-tank mine. Uh, this is, these are all anti-personnel mines. Basically, what happens is that uh, you press on it, and as you release your foot, this thing goes off. So if you put in a very slight amount of pressure, which is below the cutoff needed for it to go off, you can still see it, but not get blown away. So that's where this comes from. So this particular study was done, this is a computer study, but we actually did field study as well, where we actually come around and as the as, as the you know uh, mechanical energy goes in, it bounces off the, the surface of the mine. And you can see here that it's approximately circular because what we had placed underneath was roughly circular. So if we place something underneath which is a different shape, then this thing would roughly show a different shape. So, so in other words, you can use this kind of impulse acoustics to find mines. I was not the first one. The first group that did it was Rogers and Don from Monash University in Australia. So I learned about their work as we were doing this, but we were able to take it to a somewhat higher level of precision as we But many other groups also did this work. So just to tell you how much of a problem it remains even now, uh, here you can see somebody uh, using uh, a standard um, you know, metal detector. Because most of these landmines have a tiny little fuse, which is metal in. And so what this does is it can pick up that metal and it's easy to find them. But it turns out that if you, if you explore the ground, you'll find lots of tiny little pieces of metal. So you have a large amount of false alarm rate because not everything is coming from the landmine. But nowadays, uh, there are other ways, a very reliable way of using dogs. Uh, dogs can, dogs have extremely uh, sensitive noses and uh, billions of times more sensitive in picking up sense than us. And it turns out that uh, uh, using dogs is quite reliable. Uh, of course, human hand is among the best, but it's of course risky as well. So, so this stuff that you see uh, is, is expensive, however. So the dogs cost about, the dog and the dog trainer cost about $20,000 a piece. It's not cheap. Uh, this is the latest stuff. I just found, about, found out about it. I had heard about it some years ago, but as I was preparing for it, I had a nice cute name. Uh, this is a Scandinavian group, I believe, uh, called Hero Rats. They're actually, they're actually rats. So those rats are genetically modified such that they can pick up the, pick up the scent of the explosives. And there's a group uh, in Hunter College in New York. Uh, they have come up with this mouse sensor 
which is actually a mouse, uh, with uh, a highly sensitized, genetically modified uh, nose. You have a cute nose, you have to agree. But you know, th this is really cool, right? Because the, uh, and in Africa, they're using giant uh, rats. They're pretty big rats. They're almost like tiny little dogs. So I saw pictures of them. So anyway, things are moving along. Uh, and you can see here something which is more high tech. Well, this is also high tech because it's genetically modified. But here you can, you can send a sound pulse and you can get the vibrations out. And from that, you can check. So there are various ways. Technology is moving along. I'm happy to see that. I don't lose problem much these days, but I retain the healthy. So in other words, you know, looking inside sand is not easy. So let's let's move on. We have, so I hope I've told you a little bit about all these wonderful problems that come around that you start poking around with, with sand. Right? So we decided to go small. I told you, I promised you I'll go small. So we made smaller and smaller particles. So these are actually nanoparticles that we made in the computer. I'll show you a real nanoparticle as well. And we decided to collide it because we were checking if Earth's law works and all that. So you can see that if you collide them harder and harder, they get kind of deformed. And at about 400 some meters per second, uh, it's about like this, about 100 meters per second, they get kind of you know, squashed when they hit each other. And if you get up to rifle uh, velocities, which could be about 1,000 meters per second, about a kilometer per second, if it not get to that, uh, you see that most nanoparticles would tend to disintegrate. Uh, they're not that hard, unless they're particularly designed to be very hard. So why am I telling you this? Because it turns out that uh, interstellar space has a great deal of nanoparticle collision. So if you look at if you look at the sky, uh, and if you look at if you do a chemical analysis of the sky, you will find that most of most of the, the material in the universe is hydrogen, made of hydrogen, uh, and some helium. So that's the bulk of the material, and much of this is sitting. If it's not in galaxies and so on and so forth, stars and what have you, uh, there's a great deal of material in interstellar gas. The interstellar gas, of course, is molecular level. And then you have the interstellar dust, which is clusters of particles. And it turns out that these interstellar dust particles, they, 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 they're very important because they carry, they carry the history of where they came from, right? So the, something came from a supernova explosion, something came from collisions of some asteroid, something came from the disintegration of some planet, something came because some weird stuff exploded. So all that history is embedded in these nanoparticles. And it turns out you can actually study that. So we can only get up to about a kilometer per second in our in our machines. But I, I found out that there is a group in Japan and they have built a dedicated computer in which they can study nanoparticle collisions at 15,000 meters per second. Just imagine. So they can really look at the chemistry of what happens with these particles. And there's a great deal to be learned there. And very recently, there was this probe that NASA had sent out. So basically, this probe got into space and just hung out there for a while with its stuff open so it can collect uh, dust particles. And it turns out that it collected. Um, seven pressure specks of dust, and those seven pressure specks of dust are from outside the solar system. So in other words, you have this enormous wealth of data coming around, which are nanoparticles in space from outside the solar system, from inside the solar system, that tell us about the history of evolution of these systems, which actually we don't know a lot about. In fact, we don't even we don't even know how many planets we have anymore, right? We lost Pluto, we got somebody back. We have been discovering stuff in the Kuiper belt every other day. So we haven't, although we have gone outside the solar system as far as the Voyagers go, um, we still are struggling to figure out our own uh, home base. These are actual nanoparticles. I didn't put, I didn't make them on the computer. These are actual, these are real guys. So these were made uh, in my friend, uh, Professor Vinod Hussain's lab in uh, in Bengal Engineering College in Shippur, which is now called Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology. So uh, he actually made these nanoparticles in his lab, and you can see uh, how they are. And this actually is a, is a highly enlarged figure of a 
basically they were a silicate sheet, I think. Uh, and with laser, he cut the screw with a channel, and then he put some nanoparticles in this channel. So this is work in progress. We are trying to make these granular alignments, but in the nanoscale to see if we can make them really fancy materials. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to be able to make, which is what we are trying to work on, is you can develop a material in which you can have an impact or something coming at one end, but the whole thing is diverted off so it doesn't get to the other end. In other words, this can become a structure that does complete shock and sound proofing. Just to give you a sense of things, you might wonder why do I want to do something soundproof, which is soundproof. But but you know, uh, our ears are not that great. Our ears are very good at low frequencies, so we can go down with very, very fine sounds. Uh, how fine, I don't know, but I'm told pretty much as fine as molecular level motion. That's what our ears can sense. But our ears also get really damaged at the higher frequency end. And the highest frequencies we can take are about 20,000 hertz, 20 kilohertz. So one of those shrieky horns that you get from the buses, that probably gets up to eight or 10 kilohertz, I imagine. So those are really bad for us because they damage it. And as we age, our hearing goes down. And worldwide, uh, there are about 400 some million people who actually have uh, a significant amount of hearing loss. And you can imagine that uh, somebody with hearing loss uh, cannot really do the things that you do in your everyday life. So it's a huge problem. So, and it turns out the problem is getting worse and worse because people who are exposed to industrial level noise and so on, they, they really suffer. So the question about whether we can make something fully soundproof uh, is it, not only important for making fancy things like a, like a noiseless car, but they're also important for protecting ourselves and this is one structure we are trying to design right now, where right? any any sound that goes in cannot go further beyond this point and bounces back up. This is possible, I believe, and we're working on it. So, how much time do I have? At least 15 minutes? Okay, thank you. So, let me now, let me now go a little bit finer. I've been telling you, boring you to death about dust, uh, about sand, sand, right? Let me tell about dust. So, this dust problem came to me actually because of NASA. A friend of mine uh, called me up and he said, hey, we have a problem with the space station and I need somebody who, who, who can think about weird stuff and to help me out. I said, okay, go on. So he showed up in my office one day and he said, you know, the International Space Station has been ordered for a long time. It went up in the, I don't know when it went up, but back in the late 70s. And uh, they have a dust problem. So they're very nice filters, but it turns out they still have a dust problem. So what kind of a dust problem do they have? So I, you know, I went to some NASA workshops and I started asking questions. And I asked them what kind of protocols they have, so what kind of clothes we wear, because they found out most of the dust that we have around us. Uh, guess who makes it? Who makes the dust? You know? Huh? No brave souls. Yes. Degradation of like regular around us. Actually, we are the worst makers of dust ourselves. Uh, yes. Skin. Yeah. Our skins are terrible. We are continuously making a mess. Um, so it turns out that most of the dust that you see. We make them. Um, and then, of course, there is hair. Hair is sharp, right? So, what happens to your sharp stuff? You guys know? Huh? Cuts? No, bad, worse things than cutting happens. When something is sharp, charge is like to get in there. The charge is of sharp corners, right? So, when you have hair or when you have fiber, which is continuously coming out of this clothes that we wear, all those things they attract more dust because they attract the charges, and these charges attract and repel other bodies. And before you know it, you have these dust bunnies. You know what dust bunnies are? All those squiggly things that you have on the floor, 
that accumulated the thing, and you think who made the mess? Well, you made the mess. So, right. So, so that's what was happening in the space station. So it turns out when I when I started asking questions as, as to what kind of protocols the astronauts have, you know, it's interesting that we really didn't know all that much about about dust. And so this is a picture of dust that I stole off the internet, and you can see uh, this is a dust mite. Do you think you don't have dust mites in your home? Well, you'll be surprised. Uh, these are our skin scales. Yeah. So this is about 140 microns. So that's about 0.14 millimeters, right? That's below our little sea level. Uh, if you have a dog, we all like dogs. So that's from the dog. Uh, so on and so forth. You can see some hair, some fiber. So this is basically the portrait of dust. And it's very, very difficult to clean it because, uh, well, these are good things I've done. So these are actually dust mites. Uh, they're adult dust mites. They're 100 to 600 microns. And we typically have them at home. We don't see them. But tonight you won't sleep well because you're looking for dust mites in your home. Uh, so just to give you a sense of, sense of uh, length involved, you can see that human hair is between 70 and 100 microns. 0.1 millimeters. Uh, human sneeze. Between 10 and 100 microns. All this stuff is there. Uh, I didn't do it. You, you did it. Fed uh, dander. You have a cat, you're a dog, you have a mouse, you have a squirrel. You know. You're talking really tiny stuff. You have pollen, well, that's season. Spores from plants. You have mold, you probably have mold, you can it get pretty moldy, it's pretty moist out there. Either in Buffalo, it can also get pretty moldy, so it get a lot of snow, and some rain or so. Uh, that's my debris, you know what that is, that's my food. So, uh, you can see that's also there. Household dust, stuff that comes out of everything else. Uh, skin plates are real tiny, and then you have bacteria. So this is what dust is. Dust is very much a part of our lives. And what is difficult about dust, which is why we have trouble cleaning it, is because they run a length scale, which runs over four decades. So 100 of a micron, that's 10 to the minus eight meters, to 100 microns, that's 10 to the minus four meters. So that's a, that's a huge length scale over which you are trying to filter stuff out. And um, then, of course, there's another kind of dust, right? This, for example, is one of my favorite cities, Delhi. And you can see the India Day, and you can see how the sky looks. And if you look at the, if you look at this region, this region of India from space, uh, any any region that doesn't look dark uh, or light orange means that the sunlight is reaching the ground. And any region that looks uh, Dark orange or light orange, that means less and less sunlight reaching the ground. Darker means even less sunlight is reaching the ground. And here you can see how bad it is in New Delhi. Uh, Lucknow is not good either. Once you get to the heart, uh, things are pretty bad. This is, of course, the area of Punjab, uh, and so on and so forth. So now, this is very bad for us because of our lungs, right? So our lungs are not designed to be exposed to very tiny particles. And most of the particles that, that, are, that are here are about 2.5 micron or smaller. And, and at that length scale, they get pretty deep into our lungs. So uh, that's why people are worried about it, because these all have unknown health consequences that we eventually pay for. It's really important for us to be cognizant of that, and take care of it, and see if we can remove it. So this is. Let me skip this. This is something just to make the point that if you're trying to design a filter, uh, you'll find um, what is pretty obvious is that uh, if you take an air filter, which is pretty cheap, you can buy it in most uh, appropriate stores. Um, as the air, dusty air goes through it, uh, it tends to get stuck in the, in the mesh, right? But what happens then is that as the filter ages, it can catch more and more fine dust. So an old filter in that argument would be a good filter because it can take large and small dust particles. 
But you don't want that because the old filter also blows dust every time it moves. So it really isn't helping a lot. It may be helping a little bit. And of course, nobody says, oh, I'd love to have an old filter. Can you give me one? But that's not fashion. That's the poorest thing to do. Right. So the thing is that we don't have very efficient filters. We have very fine filters, the so called filter filters, that you can buy which are expensive. But we don't really have the right kind of filtration. There's a great deal of work that goes on in the world on filtration. And if we understand filtration uh, of dust, we can also use that science and technology to filter water. Because guess what? We are running out of good water in the world. Um, if you look at Jordan, for example, in another 15, 20 years, Jordan is going to be in deep trouble because Jordan is running out of water. And that's just not Jordan. That's a story across the world because high quality water uh, is becoming a problem. Um, and also the time of change, some of that is more of a problem than ever before. So let me now, um, before I go to the next next talk, try and summarize this part a little bit. So filters are inexpensive, but they cannot take out undesirable materials that are too small unless they are nearly too long. Uh, so basically a filter gets better uh, with age, but that's not a good thing. That's not what we really ideally want. How do you make fine filters which don't nearly stop the flow? Because if you make the, make the pores too fine, nothing will flow out of that. So you have pressure build up and everything will collapse. You don't want that either. So this is a research question uh, to, to which we don't have very good answers even today. We're talking about dust, we're talking about simple stuff. See, you don't have you don't even know the science. Forget about technology. Uh, how does our body filter our desirable objects? You can ask this question because our body does filter a lot of things, right? We are, we are excellent filters ourselves, that, that's what keeps us alive. So, and there you begin to get to some really fancy times, which is beautiful. What you find is that, you know, over two billion years over which we have evolved, uh, we have become very good biologically in exploiting charges. So, positive negative charges. In, in the right geometry, in the right chemistry uh, around it, can be a very, very efficient way of filtering in terms of interatomic forces and so on. So we are barely beginning to understand some of these processes. Some of it has come through follower science, come through biological sciences, come through physics, and so on. And there are other things you can do. You can use magnetic fields, you can use sound waves, and so on and so forth, to forge together various ideas to see if you can solve the problem. Which is what we do as, as scientists. So I'm now going to nearly last part of my talk. So coffee states, as you can see, the coffee state, right? Uh, this is a some other kind of stain. And those of you who like to do watercolor painting, you rely on this stuff, right? So uh, this is a stain from wine, also very similar. Uh, this is red wine. This is still, as you can see. And if you if you look at it, you'll see that there's something very interesting going on. All these stains have darker edges, right? They have darker edges. So this problem actually came up in a very really casual conversation um, in the late 90s, uh, 96, 97, at uh, at University of Chicago, and the person who got very curious and wanted to look deeper. It's somebody who had a great deal of regard for and um, inspired me over the years, uh, directly and indirectly, is Sidney Nagel from New Chicago. So Sid Nagel actually explored this problem back in 97, along with uh, a whole bunch of scientists from Chicago and students. And more recently, uh, Martin Yolk, who is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, he and several others have been looking at these problems. If you, if you want, if you're interested, you can Google it up. Now, so, so the question is why do we care? Right? What's the big deal about having a dark edge uh, uh, in, a, in a liquid drop? And this was a question that Sid asked that, well, do we understand it and do we need to care about it? And quite strangely, uh, we did really get it. We didn't really have a very good understanding of why these things happen. Now, the question is why do we care? But it turns out that standard answer, uh, there'll be more answers than this, uh, is that how do you deposit fine particles 
is actually very important in our everyday lives. It's important for the egg industry, for example. It's important for protein crystallization, which tells us about enzymes. It's important for making tiny, highly efficient electronic circuits that you have in your computer, inside your watches, and so on and so forth. So this is actually important science. The fact is we don't really uh, easily understand why the particles get near the edges. Now it turns out uh, this is the neighbor, by the way. So I've I've taken some quotes from uh, some news stories uh, from the time back back in the late nineties, and Sip says almost every kind of experiment you can think of, you can do, meaning without much trouble. Uh, said neighbor. Does the type of solvent involved make a difference? No. Does the same thing happen with other similar materials like red wine, milk, tea, and soup? Yes. Different types of surfaces on which it can happen metals, plastic, glass, still produce solvents. In fact, even drying the drop upside down produces the exact same thing. That's pretty interesting. Though. Even gravity doesn't change it. So experiments in a variety of surfaces show that any surface, so any surface, it doesn't matter what, it has some roughness, right? Because there is a common scale roughness in shape. So it turns out that the surface roughness essentially holds tight the edges of a drop. So the edge gets quote unquote pinned. So when a physicist says pin, pin means that part doesn't move. So the edge of the drop gets fixed. So as the evaporation happens from the edge of the drop, which is fixed, liquid is being lost. And as liquid is being lost, the particles that are inside are getting dragged out that the liquid is being lost. In other words, there is a current that develops in which all the particulate matter that's sitting along with the drop, they get dragged out to the edges. And the liquid essentially tries to beef up the middle, which is getting back. So you can see that this is where the evaporation happens, and all the stuff flows to the edges. And you can see here, angular pictures taken over, over various times, you can see that particles are actually particle traces. Particles are moving and getting deposited near the edge. That's really how it works and disappears. Uh, in, this is uh, from Sid's group, uh, Robert Higgins, so uh, in nature in 1997. So, well, this is really fascinating stuff. So we are beginning to understand how something as simple as this can be can be understood and can have technological consequences and importance. So let me now turn to the last topic I want to talk about, the discoveries we made. There's so many discoveries we made. So why should I be even talking about it? Who am I to tell you what discoveries we make anyway? Well, I want to tell you something that's closely related to what all I have covered so far. And something that we all face every day. It doesn't matter if you're in Calcutta or Delhi or in Buffalo, New York, or in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or in New York City. It doesn't matter. You go to London with the same problem, you go to Paris with the same problem. The degrees vary. But the particular problem that I want to talk about here is soot, which is the black carbon dust. We all know that we have that on us on any given day uh, in a big city. It doesn't matter where it is. So here, for instance, is actually uh, soot coming out from a, from a bus. I believe it's in India somewhere. And you know, growing up, I actually loved this smell. So when I went to the US as a kid, I was 20 some years old, I used to miss this smell. So that's how crazy it is. I love, I still do it. These are spent. I go and spend it. So, uh, you got it. All right. So, you know, so here you can see industries, right? A lot of, a lot of pollution in industries. Um, this is in China. You can see how, how deep and dense smog is. Um, this is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is very much of an industrial town. It's changing over the years. But Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, this is where Detroit, these are industrial towns in the US and dating back to many years ago. And this is a very fancy truck, as you can see. Uh, you probably can't tell, but this license plate is from near me, it's in Pennsylvania. So blue and yellow is Pennsylvania license plate. 
So this guy is uh, happy going off on a steam, going on steam, it's going off, it's going off slurp. So it turns out that most of the slurp is in this range, it's about two and a half microns smaller. And that's bad enough that it gets into deeper and reaches our lungs and is quite responsible for a great deal of diseases that we suffer from on a regular basis. Just to give you a sense of soot, because one of the things I was trying to do yesterday, so uh, I thought I should probably end with a little bit of discussion on soot, because it's closely tied to granular systems and it's closely tied to dust. What can I say? And I, and I went to look at the literature somewhat deeply, and I can tell you there's very little out there. Certainly not the stuff on which you can write a book. Okay. So we know very little about so in a real sense. Why? Because so is very complicated. Okay. So this is actually a computer image of so. This is so that's essentially you know linked and linked and linked and linked. This is basically carbon along with hydrocarbons and this and that and water. So it becomes a bit of a mess. But basically, this is what it is. The recent paper also. 2012, just six years ago. So, this is hair, this huge ivory like thingy. Not my hair, I'm losing hair. Maybe yours. Uh, so, you see, this is hair, this is beach sand, and you can see that uh, 10 microns or lower would be the blue part of this here. That's still the big guys, that's still pretty bad for us. And the two and a half microns you are looking at uh, is the small red guys here. So, so this stuff here is actually clusters of that that make the rest, not just one of those. So clusters of those piled up almost to make a grain, like a ball. That's the rest. So you can see that's very complicated. And that's the reason why not a great deal of work has been done so far. You want to simplify. Whenever you do science, the hardest task is to ask the right question and say, getting an answer is easier. The hardest job is to ask the question. Okay, so here, uh, this is from a jet engine, for example. Um, these are from various automotive engines, um, and these are actually essentially chains of carbon particles with other stuff uh, latched onto it. That's your that's your daily soot. Do we understand their properties? No, we don't. But I can tell you that they're everywhere. In as pristine a place as in the Rocky Mountains, Northern Rocky Mountains of British Columbia, Canada, which is a very sparsely populated area by and large. This is the Athabasca Glacier. I've been there. And I visited this place in 1995. And I can tell you, even then it looked like this. This is supposed to be solid sheet ice. But you can see how much dust is sitting on. So this is just an example from one part of the world. I was looking at pictures in, in Iceland. I was looking at pictures in Patagonia, southern Chile and Argentina, and you find similar kind of carbon pollution. So at any rate, um, I just want to point out that this is very complex physics. Um, grains have strong forces between them. I hope I've told you that. Uh, they have exciting energy transport properties. I'll try to convince you about that a little bit. Uh, they can become highly mobile, as you saw grains going from Africa to America, for example. Um, they can cluster up and start to behave like polymers. So these are polymers, these long chain molecules that I just showed you, these soot particles. Um, they are called polymers. Polymers basically means they're chains of stuff that together. So, these are examples of what we call a complex system, for the lack of a better, better way to name them. And many similar discoveries will have to come if humans are to survive this plan. Humans have not been in this plan for very long, right? As you can see here, if you, if you look at the evolution of the world, of our Earth, 4.7 billion years, in that time scale, we have been around for 0.2. Uh, million years, okay, billion to million. So if you if you look at this as a 12-hour cycle, we have been around for two seconds. That that's how little our footprint on Earth has been time-wise 
but our footprint on Earth industrially has been very damaging. And this needs to be fixed because we won't survive what we have done. There's no way we would. No matter what you no matter what you're reading here, things are pretty bad. So you know, uh, this is a problem that we face every day. And this is just a random thing I searched out yesterday. Uh, that two states with which I have the largest connections, Bengal and Maharashtra. My wife is Maharashtra. Uh, you can see that some of the very polluted areas uh, in India actually are in these two states Asimsol, Barakpur, Kathika, Durgapur, Haurav, Anivan, Shankar, Vardhapur, and Vilasanar. So, this, of course, we know that there, you know, this is just it's just a punch, small punch, and this is a very large problem. And I'm by no means trying to single out Calcutta or anything like that, but I'm saying that this is something that's a huge problem, and um, I can worry about it. But it's more important that you guys worry about it because you know what is what you have going for you that you don't have going for me. That's my last question to you. What is it? What? Time. But more than time, you're younger. And what is special about being young? You guys have adolescent brains. I have an older brain. And adolescent brains, it turns out, are the most creative brains that we that we have in that period of our lives. It's a long time, it's not just teenage years. They typically can run up to your 30s. So you have some time to be crazy. But this is the time you can go out and change the world. Uh, of course, humans humans end up making wonderful discoveries also in their lives. There's no real rationale, as far as I know, that you know you become old and useless. Uh, that's an adage that's not quite true. I don't think I become useless. I hope not. That would be depressing. But you know, you guys really have the creative energy, and so you solve. And guess what? Without the adolescent brain, humans would not have survived until now. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will be taking questions, but one by one. Uh, but we'll start with uh, this gentleman here. Please introduce yourself first, then ask questions. I'm Mr. Day. I'm basically a school teacher. Coincidentally, I was in South Point last six years. Uh, because that I was somewhere else. Now I have brought the kids from DPS, one of the DPS schools. Well, uh, well sir, actually, uh, one question is doing rounds just particularly this season, few months back. We have uh, observing a lot of thunder lightning over Calcutta and other suburban areas. And uh, as usual, the social media was quite worried about it because a lot of deaths have taken place into that. And there was a discussion going on in television, a panel discussion where one panelist was from the Weather Meteorological Department. And he pointed out that because of the pollution level has increased, maybe because of this dust and other carbon particles, etc., as you say. Uh, the lightning thunder, the rate of thunder has increased. Do you really find any connection between these two, the thunder and the pollution, the rains, and all that? That's an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that. But maybe all I can tell research. you, huh? maybe for your future research. Yeah, but I, I don't like charges so much. But uh, I will give the charge. But anything which is pointy. Is not not that good, right? Because they, they tend to attract intellectuals. So um, this kind of polymer structures, which clearly tend to form, may be the reason why this has been suggested. But I think this should probably be checked experimentally in the laboratory, which probably should be possible to do. Uh, they, it, it's not easy to uh, look at this field. There are people who do that for a living. I know. Um, but it's it's a very specialized area, uh, but it's possible. I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't rule it out at all because anything that has this kind of you know scratching structure can attract uh, yeah charge charge 
charge type effects which can cause pain. Anybody else? Hey, I put everybody to sleep. Anybody else? You want to ask any questions? So, ah, I'm Jenny. Um, I had a question about the space station dust research. What, what came of that? And are you working on that? Okay. That's a good question. Actually, space station dust research in uh, it was stopped in 2005 because of budgetary issues. Uh, or 2006, I don't remember. But it was largely delegated from the community to NASA. So NASA has various groups um, in spread around the various centers, and they have been looking at it. And have, they actually have some fantastic people there. In fact, I was planning on showing some of the work by Carlos Carrie in uh, NASA Kennedy, but I thought it would become a bit technical. One of the things that they have tried to do is they have used sound to shake off dust, which not only is useful for space station type things, but also is useful for uh, astronaut suits. Because one of the things that happens is uh, uh, we don't have, at least last I knew, we don't have the kind of space suits. Uh, that can stop fine dust, nanoscale dust from getting through. And uh, I think Harrison, Harrison, Harrison was the last astronaut in uh, Apollo 17. She had met him and I worked with him. I forgot um, his, his first name. But anyway, uh, so Harrison was the, was the geophysicist. He was the only geophysicist astronaut, as far as I know, who, who, was, who went to the moon. And he spent 72 hours. That was the longest mission. Uh, on the moon surface, and uh, one of the things that happened then was, was uh, I think he ended up having quite a bit of dust in him. Um, so, uh, so, some of this work has been to design uh, things that shake off this dust by sending uh, oscillating currents, small currents, so that, that the dust doesn't stick. They have done a great deal of work, so I think that's moving along well, but it hasn't already, you know, spilled off. To, uh, in terms of societal dividend in a big way yet, because it, it largely became an internal NASA mission at that time uh, because of budget crisis that took place. Our research is all things change. Yes, there's a question here. Uh, I'm basically a student coordinator from the city. But more of it, I'm a science student in the world of my heart, and it has been a great time listening to you. And so, regarding uh, the problem of filtration, uh, there is a thing called charge precipitator, which basically eats separate dust particles on the basis of charge, on the basis of charge right. given to them. So, is there a solution to yeah. things? Like, sure. Uh, sure. Basically, yeah. for filtration of water, because water is also charge. Yes and no, because uh, Okay, so the, so the short answer is that almost all the approaches we have uh, have limitations. So anything based upon charge also has a set of limitations. I think based on sound has a set of limitations. Uh, there is a bigger problem here, which I think the understanding which will help us. And the bigger problem is that uh, it is difficult to understand uh, the flow of fluids, flow, flow of gases and liquids through relatively small uh, pores. So, for example, you can have, let's say, a thin filter, right? And as the fluid comes and hits the filter, uh, part of it will go back because it will hit a block area. Part of it will go through. But when the part that turns around uh, hits the stuff that's coming towards it, these two are not going to be friends. So they're going to collide. And they're going to make a mess, right? So it turns out that near the filter, there is a turbulent type behavior that comes, turbulence behavior, and then there's a pressure built up. So one of the things that you don't want is you don't want much of a pressure built up because that would slow down, if not make the filtration problematic. So you want to control the pressure built up 
by designing the right kind of filters or perhaps sequence of filters or vibrating filters or doing things like that. So you can do part of it can be done using charges, part of it can, if, if the system responds to charges, part of it can be done using sound, uh, part of it really can be done by temperature uh, and also by chemistry, right? So all of these things therefore need to be used and water filtration uh, is an issue that comes around at, at that fine scale because it would be very, very nice to get the filter water at fine scale uh, easily, uh, which would remove a lot of stuff that we have around us. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. So it's a complicated problem, and, and I think that, that we have a lot to learn. Uh, but fluid filtration is still partly coming along. But when you mix fluid with other things like dust and so on, which is what we often encounter in real life, that, that makes things a little bit more, more messy stuff. There's a great deal to be done there. Uh, you just don't get it. So you have to get Somebody in the back. Somebody in the back. Uh, so, one of the major problems is speech that we love. So, uh, it's uh, causing a threat to all the uh, space stations and satellites that are in orbit. And uh, so, so, what's your take on that? Because uh, all the satellites that were once left behind and that have been um, um, somewhat. Um, yeah. That are out of service now have disintegrated into smaller pieces and particles, which pose as a threat to other mechanical instruments present in the space. So, what's your take on that? Thank you. I mean, that's a that's a serious question, actually, and uh, I'm I'm not the I'm not the knowledgeable person in the field, but I imagine that uh, the debris is in a is in a belt. Uh, around the earth, and that belt may not be fixed, that belt may have its own dynamics because one of the reasons why we are alive on earth and we can have a normal life is because of the magnetic field. And the earth's magnetic field does dictate a great deal of what, what's around because most of them are magnetic. So, gravity, magnetic, uh, magnetic field effects, any kind of solar. Um, storm effects, all of these would come into play. And of course, we have somehow managed to avoid by parking our observatories in the right uh, you know, orbit such that we don't get hammered by space dust. But this is a serious problem from what I understand, what I've read about. And uh, I don't know. I mean, this is a problem that's not going to go away easily, right? Because we have stuff in space and not all of it comes back. Some of it falls down, burns up, which is, which is okay. But a lot of it is just there. And uh, it can fall on us or it can just get dragged out of the orbits as well. Uh, so it, it poses to be to be a threat and we have to we have to be home. Um, so I worry about these things when I hear about you know Elon Musk sending people out of space. Uh, it's very exciting. Right, you know, I don't want to go to space and get hit by space debris and be dead. That, that won't be fun. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, right. This is, yes, it's a good, good problem to work on. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, there's somebody in the back. Those are going to have some people. The point is, you don't have a Borghese moon surface because there is. Yeah, right. So, yeah, so basically, it's, it's, the, it's the unevenness of the surface that would pin, that would pin the liquid. That's what we see, right? And you can imagine why, because this is where. The liquid drop is fallen, so the edge of the liquid is where uh, the depth is the, is the smallest, and so the forces there would be quite strong, wouldn't it? Because you'll have strong interatomic forces coming into play, and the other forces as well. And so, 
it would it would like to kind of stick around because the inter-atomic forces would be strong. Um, and, and that's what drives it. Now, if something were perfectly smooth, uh, the other way of posing that would be if the, uh, if the unevenness is sufficiently small that the liquid itself doesn't see it, right? Suppose the liquid is, is very, very thick and it doesn't somehow feel the unevenness. If that were to happen, then I would imagine the dynamics would change. Uh, and in fact, some such work may not be just this, but some work which is which also you know varies the shapes of the particles that are suspended in the liquid has been done by Arjun Yod's group. So you can look into that. I was just I, I was curious. I was reading it. I've always found this problem to be very interesting because anything you do with uh, drops is uh, has a lot of length scales that get involved. Um, okay. no, I shouldn't put my finger in my mouth, but pull out some spit and stretch my finger. So negatives which are done show on that and you will find extremely tiny droplets form. And they have beautiful properties. They go down to atomic scale as you separate before the tear. So these are fascinating problems and there are a lot of questions to be asked. And unfortunately many of these questions need to be really asked first experimentally because they're just very difficult to answer. Great question, thank you. Somebody had a question. Yeah, I had a question. So what will happen if the center into a second? Into a second one. Oh they do. Uh, typically uh, well, let's be clear first. If all satellites would have some dust because it came from Earth, right? presumably it would have some dust. Even clean rooms would have a little bit of dust, uh, maybe very little. So, once it's parked in space, um, as far as I know, the environment is pretty pristine um, in space if it's parked in the right orbit. Uh, so the, the dust that you would probably get would be um, dust that's in order from solar system debris, from planetary or satellite debris, and from outside the solar system and beyond. But that's not a whole lot. But all of that does end up there. I mean, uh, in fact, the picture I showed you where they collected dust, that was not very high up in the orbit, but they can analyze both that. So most of the time, that kind of dust is very tiny, it's probably nanoscale, and it may not have a tremendous bearing on the uh, performance of the solar panels and so on, which, which would be involved. But you know, imagine a speck of dust gets into the eye of the Hubble telescope, right? The Hubble telescope uh, is one of the most sophisticated instruments we have had for a while, and now there's another one going on with its name. Um, so, so in these telescopes, when dust gets in, that can cause a real problem, right? Because the Hubble right now is looking at some of the deepest reaches of the universe. So the stuff that we see is very, 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 very faint. It's among the faintest things that we see, and this dates back to half a billion years or something after the Big Bang. So once you get to that kind of uh, detail, which is some what nearly thirteen point seven billion no, 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 with thirteen some billion years, you know, billion light years away. That's that's pretty fun scale. So their dust would have a big effect, even a little bit of dust. You can't have that. But solar panels and stuff, I, I don't know if that's enough. But you should look at Hubble stuff if you haven't already. I was uh, I was visiting um, this uh, National Radio Astronomy Observatory, which is a bun bunch of radio telescopes, big big dishes in the New Mexico desert. And uh, they had seen, you know, some of these very far away objects. And that was going to show that they were, I was just visiting, I didn't go there, it was just it's very fun. And uh, so the accuracy needed is unbelievable. But, but it's amazing that we can do it, right? And we can do it at a level of precision that is unbelievably good. So yeah, small specks of dust can cause real problems with any kind of optical instrument. By the way, 
all the stuff that the Mars rover and everything right now has been sleeping because I don't know if you're following the news because the Mars has less gravity than Earth as you know and Mars doesn't have a magnetic field so Mars's atmosphere and how dust storms and so on behave on Mars are very different. One thing that happens on Mars is that once dust storms start they can actually engulf the whole planet and last for a long time. So right now Mars is having a pretty nasty dust storm that's been going on for a while. So all of the NASA guys, the rovers and so on, they're all shut down and sleeping because they don't want to get beat up by the dust. And NASA is hoping that once the dust settles, things will spring back to life again. We don't know. It might get damaged. So the answer to your question is in many cases we don't know, especially for exploring other objects. There is a question. I don't know how are we doing on time. So uh, everybody is waiting up now. So we have just two more questions. This lady there and this lady here. Uh, I'm from the Cambridge School and I wanted to ask, uh, as you mentioned before, that there are many sources of dust. So is there a proven process in which we can eliminate dust from our system or like from our environment and from I would like to do that. Uh, that's hard, right? Because, okay, so, so we, we do eliminate a substantial amount of dust from many of the laboratories in space. So, for instance, when we make very high quality uh, electronic circuits or devices and so on, uh, quantum devices, for example, which are pretty much playing with a few atom type stuff. Uh, there, the clean room uh, requirements are very high, which means that, you know, the amount of external particles and so on that can be present is really low. So, uh, so we, we can, on Earth, we can make environments that are virtually just free. That's one thing. So that's for hi-fi experiments, right? The other, I think what you are asking is more in our environment on a regular basis. And there it becomes very hard because uh, let's say we can't change ourselves. So we are going to produce skin flakes and so on and so forth. We're going to shed hair and all that, all that will happen. So that's one dust you can't get rid of. But there are dusts that you can, dust particles that you can probably minimize. And that would be dust particles coming from maybe, you know, mold, dust particles coming from. Uh, any kind of pollution, right? Uh, these are things that we can control. And believe it or not, that is a very significant effect uh, on Earth climate. Uh, and dust is, it's not just particular dust that can cause the problem, it's just the wrong kind of chemicals can cause the problem as well. Um, and all of this can contribute to unknown issues that are very serious issues. Uh, you may not remember this, but years ago, uh, Earth developed a hole above Antarctic, uh, and that hole was basically because the ozone concentration above the Antarctic depleted, and that was because of use of certain chemicals, mostly the free outside chemicals, for example. And so, uh, basically, what was done was we came up with uh, with fluids that did the same thing but that didn't damage the ozone there. So that, that research was done almost in war footing. It was developed and now pretty much worldwide has been deployed and spawned the ozone hole has been repaired. Dust, to some degree, can be, can be controlled, but to some degree it cannot be controlled. It's a part of the Earth climate, so it's very complex. For example, you know that there is a volcano that's been going up in Hawaii now since 1903, okay? and it's been really acting up lately. It's been, you know, getting into homes and killing people and so on, doing very bad things. But the fact is, when these volcanoes go off, they not only put out poisonous gases, they also put out a lot of particulate matter. Some years ago, there was a volcano like that that went off in Iceland. And that was so bad that the air traffic had to literally come to a halt between US and Europe and you know many of the areas of the world, transatlantic air, air. And in fact, it spread beyond transatlantic because it was 
circulated in this world. These become stopped. I mean, if you look at the history of the world, we've had super volcanic explosions every some 10, 50, 60 million years, and that has changed the world altogether. And we've probably headed up to one from Yellowstone or somewhere in Bali or something. Those become stopped. But we can stop the man-made ones, which are, which are causing unknown effects. Because it's one thing to know about volca what volcanic explosions can do, because that has, been, that has happened over the 4.7 million year evolution. But what we are doing in the 0.2 million years that we have been here can also have very bad consequences. So yeah, so that filtration has to be really invented in many ways, because one thing is to stop doing it, but what about the stuff that's already out there, right? Can we, are we so silly that we can't fix it? I think we can, but we have to go out and discover what needs to be discovered. To be to so that's why we are now going to work. Thank you so much. So thank you everybody. Uh, before we wind up, we have a small token of appreciation from yeah, and that's the whole decision to be handed over by a director. But it's on the interest of how much more on the virus. Thank you. And we thank you. Thank you, the school present here, the teachers. Thank you for coming here. We wind up our session here and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much. And one announcement please redeem your coupons from downstairs. In the downstairs portico, the people is waiting for you. Please.